Hello and well met. <laughs> I hate that. I'm sorry. Welcome to another episode of Podcast of it's, the Rings. It's staying in. Hello. Oh, I know it, know it, but it doesn't mean I don't hate it. I do hate it. Off to a great start. Already. Something I hate. It was just something I just did. Um, hi, Alex. Hi, Jess. When you tell the many amount of friends that you have about this podcast, how would you, how do you pitch this podcast to them? Well, here on the podcast of the rings. I'm asking you how you pitch it to them. Don't explain it. How would you pitch it to your friends? I would explain it. Okay. (laughs) It's a show where one person, myself, a, uh, Die hard, raging lifelong Greek. Tolkien Geek. fan. Raging Greek. Who knows, <laughs> who knows a lot about Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Has fun explaining and conversing with someone who is a fan, but maybe doesn't know that much, Jessica Birdie. <sighs> and when you listen, you're going on that journey with us. Whether you, you know want a to lot or not. And you're, yeah, whether you want to, whether you want to or, or not. Uh, whether you are on more leaning towards my side of things where you know a lot and you've read a lot of the books or you're leaning towards your side of things, Jess, where you are just learning about all of these things or a lot of these things for the first time. So you're saying it's like an anti-gatekeeping uh, like podcast where it's like, hey, you don't know this thing? Let me just teach you about this cool thing as opposed to shaming you for not knowing this thing. The gates are as wide open as they were when Mordor and the pass of Cirith Gorgoth was assaulted by the Last Alliance. We'll get to that in today's episode. I'm going to I'm going to gatekeep you cuz it's so boring. I hate when you say it perfectly. I, I was when we were rewatching the movie Mordor Mordoring. I I just I know this is how they were directed and I and I I know that if they didn't do it it wouldn't be as good, but I hate Mordor. Mordor. Like I just hate how the pronunciation had to be exactly as you wanted it to be. Uh, uh, and then when you say it, like, Durin, the Kilgar, I'm just annoyed. It's just annoying. I'm I'm trying my best. It. I haven't sort of been as fixated on the pronunciations um, as much until recently. And I'm interested, like, I think a lot of people for the first time when they see the show are going to hear these correct pronunciations. From, I didn't know... That it was Gilgalad until very recently. How did you I always find said Gilgalad. Um, so, and there's one, there's one name in here that I also recently learned the correct pronunciation I'm going to attempt to do, which is a very fun pronunciation. Well, um, I said, how did you find out how it's Gilgalad? Gilgalad. Okay, now I'm so um, Listening to Corey Olson's podcast, Exploring Lord of the Rings. Amazing. And Amazing. What, what I love, what I love about him is he still says, I'm pretty sure still says Gilgalad, even though he knows it's wrong because he's just said it that way. And you can't blame somebody for, uh, it's just like when people shame somebody for pronouncing something wrong. But in reality, that person's probably just read the word and hasn't heard it out loud. So they're doing the best they can. You know, uh, like in regards to the author, the, the author that shall not be named when she didn't know how people that people didn't know how Hermione was pronounced, pronounced. She literally had that scene in one of the books where it's like Erma one, like where one of the characters didn't know how to pronounce her name right. because most people didn't know what Hermione was. So I think I, it's okay to have your own little lore. Your I, own com- I completely agree. And my only counterpoint is, and I, I never did this deep dive because I, like I was interested in the linguistics and fascinated by the fact that Tolkien had invented these whole languages with their own rules and grammar and all of these things. But um, you can go and read the appendices and it it tells you step by step all of the phonemes and how to pronounce them in Elvish, different combinations of letters, and it tells you exactly how they are sounded out. So you so have you no could, excuse. <laughs> well, the only excuse you have is you just didn't want to read that section and do the work to learn a whole new pronunciation system. Um, if you don't which, do that, you're lame. <laughs> um, I I still haven't read through that appendice. Not gonna lie. 
Uh, but, you know, I'm picking up some of these pronunciations along the way just through other people who have done that and are educating me. So, fair. So, before we jump into Gil Galed, um, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, correction corner? today anything you want to i don't from? think there were any corrections but i could be incorrect um and hold on did anyone email us let me check <laughs> no i know for a fact we weren't emailed. you know for a fact okay well no emails no letters were sent in if you find corrections in today's episode which i'm sure there will be mistakes i believe i already made a mistake so i'm not going to say what the mistake was if you can find the mistake <laughs> five points <laughs> You can tweet at us because now our Twitter is live at Pod of the Rings. So mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, I already made a mistake and I know what it is, but I'm not going to say. I'm going to leave it up to the listener. Um, <laughs> so no corrections as of yet. We're waiting on those. What I do want to open with, though, speaking of the pronunciation of this name, it, very important um, to the fall of Gilgalad. We're going to open with that. A little poetry. Oh, um, God. Poetry is pivotal. Mm -mm. See what I did there? The alliteration poetry is pivotal. Stop explaining things. Um, Just... Poetry is pivotal to oh, the world of Arda, <laughs> how Tolkien gives the reader information in Have history. Have you explained what Arda is? Arda is the world. I got it. It's just the word for that world. It's like Earth. Yep. Um, a lot of people refer to it just as Middle Earth, but technically Middle Earth sp refers to a specific region of Arda, but it's kind of become known as just like Middle Earth means everything, but it's technically Arda. All right. If I had glasses, I'd be pushing them up right now. So <laughs> verse and poetry are very important to Tolkien conveying so information. So is prose. So is prose. <laughs> All of these things, but <laughs> Tolkien likes to use song. And verse. So okay. we're going to read the fall of Gilgalad. Um, this was, I believe, recited by Sam mm. at Weathertop, I believe. Mm. Um, at least the first three verses. And this kind of gives an overview of who Gilgalad is. So okay. Gilgalad was an elven king. Of him, the harpers sadly sing. The last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. His sword was long, his lance was keen, his shining helm afar was seen. The countless stars of heaven's field were mirrored in his silver shield. But long ago he rode away, and where he dwelleth none can say. For into darkness fell his star, in Mordor, where the shadows are. Interesting. Can you remember yes. the context under which Sam decides to share this song? Um, I think just because they're on Weathertop and he's um, sort of, they're, they're reminded of, of this place, mm -hmm. which is in ruin. And this used to be, bef before the realms in exile of Arnor and Gondor, like part of this used to be ruled over by Gilgalad. And so there's a lot of history where they are, and um, at, especially at Weathertop. Um, so I believe that's the context. And Weathertop is where Frodo gets stabbed by the, um, the top, the top wraith. The top dog. The top dog of the wraith. Yeah, the Witch King. I'm gonna wrap that, rip, 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 that. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Thank you for sharing yours. And that was mine. <laughs> Look on, the look on my face, listeners. That's not looks don't help in podcast. No, but I think they could hear it. I think oh. they could hear my look through the the silence there. Okay. Look, um, there. I mean, they did do uh, what was the rap Stephen Colbert did? It was uh, so good. The trilly, um, the trilly, the best trilly of yeah. It was really yeah. cute. But it was that's really the cute. only rap I want. Uh, I think the Witch King rap. No offense, I'm sorry. Wow, I think we can table it. If Tolkien uh, were writing this today, though, I think it would have been raps. No, don't patronize me. <laughs> okay, uh, but this is this is the the uh, the fall of Gilgalad, and this is why uh, um, you can tell it's uh, not Gilgalad, right? Gilgalad was an Elven king of him the harper. Like the the rhythm doesn't work. 
Gilgalad was an elven. Like, it fits the meter. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Anyway, that is the introductory. Who is Gilgalad? I know everyone is shouting at their (laughs) um, iPods. No, no. If they're still listening past my rap attempt. Yeah, if they didn't shut off the podcast. Which I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't either. Um, (laughs) Alex. It was a valiant attempt, but some things just aren't meant to be. Okay. Uh, so in order to talk about Gilgalad first, let's talk about the kingship of the Noldor, because this fits into his character very much. Okay. So thinking back to our episode on the elves, we had three high kings of the elves. We had um, the high king of the Noldor, the high king of the Vanyar, and the um, uh, high king of the Valmari, I believe. I'm blanking on them. Correction. Correct me. I don't remember. Um, We're professionals. We're professionals. There's so much. But the High King of the Noldor Mm -hmm. um, originally is Fenway. Fenway Park, (gasps) if you remember. Yeah, Fenway Park. When he dies, it passes to Feanor, Mm -hmm. his eldest son. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we remember all that business with the kinslaying. They get exiled. Right. So Feanor is then the king in exile. He doesn't have a kingdom to rule over. They go to Middle Earth. Um, and we didn't really talk about Feanor, but his death comes at uh, the hands of Gothmog, a Balrog. Um, oh, sheesh. Yeah. Not Gothmog that we see in in Lord of the Rings, because there's two characters named Gothmog, but Gothmog, one of the Balrogs, becomes okay. a very important lieutenant in Morgoth's army. He dies, and when he dies, kingship passes rightfully to his eldest son, and this is where we get a fun pronunciation. See if I can do this. Uh, Maethros. 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 Uh, just learned that's how you say that. Very sexy. Yes. Uh, the the you DH are. sound there being a thr. You're doing it. It's very sexy. It's doing it for me. <laughs> Look, I'll take it. Uh, Jesus. So kingship passes to Maethros. Um, but again, they don't have like a kingdom to rule over. They haven't really founded it. So they're just kind of, they have the claim to the title, but they haven't really founded it. Uh, Maethros gets Maethros. captured uh, by Morgoth. Morgoth feigns to... Uh, he sends an embassy and he's like, I'm going to give you one of the Silmarils, a peace treaty. And Maethros is kind of skeptical, but he goes anyway because he's like, well, I'm going to trick Morgoth. Uh, ends up getting ah, captured. Purposely. He, well, no, he doesn't purposely get captured. He just goes thinking he can outsmart the dude and that doesn't happen. Exactly. Yeah. He loser. He can get the, <laughs> he, is, he is kind of a loser. Uh, he, redeems him, <laughs> he redeems himself. Uh, no, he's not a loser. Um, he gets captured and hung up on a spire in Thangorodrim, Morgoth's fortress, by his wrist, by his right hand, for 30 years. What? Just for 30 years, he's hanging, literally, by his by his hand. God. I know I brought this up before, and it really is my only reference to this kind of suffrage in... Uh, in myth, but it's like Loki being held upside down and basically waterlogged or waterboarded for eternity. And the only, yeah, that's it's kind of crazy. Like to be, have that kind of anguish for that long is wild. Yeah, it, it's, it's a drop in the bucket for an elf. Correct. In, in but the that grand still doesn't mean sc- it's not s- screwed up. Yeah, it, it would still be painful. But yeah, it, in the elf lifespan, I'd be like, oh, I'm here for a while. I, right. I have to do the math of like what the percentage breakdown would be. Oh, this is a long time. Like, like oh, God, my back hurts. Yeah. <laughs> do, um, do elves sleep? Yes. Okay. I believe so. Uh, I think in, D, like in D&D, they don't. Or they don't need to, or they like, they could definitely do a long rest. They'll sit. And I know poop. in D&D they go into like a trance. Right, right. Um, but does, do we ever see, what's his face, pretty boy, fall asleep? Legolas? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if it's ever described. I, I, I'll look into this. I'll look into yeah, this for next week because I'm not sure. It would probably be in the book The Nature of Middle Earth, which I have yet to read all of. Okay. Um, but that goes through like the life cycles and uh, reincarnations. And I'm so um, glad that I'm asking the hard questions. I'm so, keeping you on track and, you know, really serving the point of this podcast. Well, the point of this is to learn more about the world. So y- you are. Great. Um, we are talking about Gilgalad, however. Um, who is an elf? Who is an elf? So, so there are worse questions. Yeah, we're not talking about you know the eagles or something. We um, should have brought them into you know. They're about to come into play because Mathros, he's hanging there for thirty years, and uh, Fingon, who is who's Mathros's, been gone. What's that? Who's been gone? It's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be a line in my rep. Big gone. Who's been wrong? He's big gone. I'm Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I didn't know was, Kanye was a Tolkien fan. Was this that better? <laughs> so much better because you did the, you know, the impression. Great. Instantly elevated it. So Fingon, who'd been gone uh, for 30 <laughs> years, he's Medros's cousin, uh-huh. the son of Fingolfin. Okay. He goes... And on a daring mission, rescues Mathros. But he has to cut his hand off to do so. Because there's so, no other way to get out of there. Yeah, he's chained What was up. holding him? What was the chain? Was just like, like a shackle. Just, just hanging from a big spire. They couldn't break the shackle? They had to do a quick... Mm-hmm. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're literally going into the heart of the, the belly of the beast... Oh, this is where... No, okay, got it. Okay, fair This is Thangorjim, like, his fortress. Right, 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 right. They they gotta act quick. So he cuts his hand off. Yikes. Oh, so so it's 27 hours. 27 and a half hours. Yeah, we... Or 48 hours. How long was that time that James Franco waited until he... 127, I don't know. There it is. Yeah. Was that it? I don't know. But yeah, if Mathros gets portrayed, I hope it is (laughs) James Franco. That'd be great. (laughs) Uh, Actually, no, I don't. That would be terrible. Because forget that guy. Yeah, terrible guy. Um, so he has to cut his hand off, which is significant because Mathros was kind of known for his sword fighting abilities. Anyway, remember, Mathros has the claim to the throne. And afterwards, after this, he decides to relinquish his claim on the title to the house of Fingolfin, where Fingon's from, right? Fingolfin is his dad. Because he is, A, grateful for the rescue, and B, feels remorse for the fact that uh, his father basically left the house of Fingolfin in the wind uh, when the Noldor were exiled. Wow. Remember that the house of Feanor gets to like take the ships and then they just leave the house of Fingolfin behind and go, you can find your own way to Middle Earth. Wow. So he feels regretful for that, relinquishes his claim on the kingship to Fingolfin and Fingolfin then becomes the next in line um and that now we get to talk about Gil Gottlieb. Um in shifting from the history in world to the history out of world, um, in the mind of Tolkien, the history of the writings. Gil Gottlieb's exact relationship to all of these elves and wh- who his par- the parentage changed many times. So in early versions of this story, Tolkien wrote him as being a direct descendant of uh, Feanor. Mm. So he was actually House of Feanor. Um, And then he also uh, wrote him as being uh, a son of Finrod, uh, who is uh, a house of Finarfin. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, related to like Galadriel, Galad- Finrod's Galadriel's brother, I believe, uh, if I'm getting that correct. Um, so those were two early versions of the story. Changed it later, and eventually, uh, the reason he changed it from Finrod was because that character, um, in his writings, he eventually realized, oh, Finrod is not going to have a wife, not going to have kids. Um, so that oh, is why when not? he. That was his conception of the character. I see. So one of the things that's interesting about Tolkien is he sort of, 
the stories evolve as he writes and iterates um, many times. So he'll be writing and then just an idea will come to him. Oh, let's make this character like this. And then that might change different relationships and change how the narrative evolves. For example, when he was writing Lord of the Rings, um, Galadriel didn't exist. And then he just got to the point where they leave, uh, leave Moria and went, what if they come upon an elven kingdom, like ruled mm. by this awesome, powerful elf woman? What, what's her name? Oh, Galadriel, I guess. And that's how the character was created. Just him writing and being like, uh, I think this character could go here. And then he developed her and then he figured out how she fit in with everything else he had already written with the Noldor. I kind of like that, though. That kind of um, denotes his style in general and why there is so much information about Middle Earth and his creations. Because he didn't scrap the idea, he put it down. as opposed, And then wasn't like afraid to change it. Like, you know, how many times have you gone like, oh, no, that's stupid. I won't write that. Yeah. And so that's cool. That's cool. Some of the books that were published later is just Christopher going, here's a, like a, a page scrawled quickly in my father's hand and all his ideas. And you get to see his kind of wow. stream of consciousness, wow. which is really cool. Um, and just how he thought about his world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that doesn't work. He can't be Finrod's kid because he eventually comes to this idea that Finrod is a, a bachelor. Um, so then he decides that um, Gilgalad will be Fingon's son. Oh. Um, Fingon being the guy, M- Mithros' Fingon. cousin. Fingon, I feel like a son of Gilgalad and Kanye. <laughs> Just the elf Kanye, little known. Uh, so Fingon. Uh, he goes, oh, maybe it'd be Fangon's son. But this causes issues because in his story at this point, um, kingship of the Noldor at one point needs to pass to Turgon. Oh! Uh, Turgon, who is Fingon's son. Or, excuse me, Fingon's brother. Turgon ain't Fingon. <laughs> Kanye. So in order for this to work, uh, because I believe Fingon... Uh, does not have kids, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, folks. Uh, so when he dies, spoilers, he dies, um, <laughs> the heir passes to the next eldest brother, which is Turgon. So gil can't be Fingon's kid because otherwise it would just pass right to gil and not Turgon, but he needs that to happen for the story he wants to tell. So then finally he goes, you're Oradreth's son, gil Now who the hell is Oradreth? Okay. So Oradreth is the cousin. Um, Fingon. He he's the he's in the house of uh, Finarfin, and he is the kid of Angrod. So Angrod is his father. Angrod being, um, so Finrod is the is basically Oradreth's uncle. So still he's related to Finrod, but. Um, yeah, so that's how how all of that works. Um, okay, so that is Gilgalad's lineage. He is the son of Oradreth, house of, uh, still house of uh, Finarfin, not the house of Fingolfin. Um, okay, so Oradreth ruled over Minas Tirith, not Minas Tirith, you know. So Minas Tirith means Tower of the Guard. Okay. Oh, so it's an Elven I name. See. Okay. So there, there was an OG Minas Tirith uh, in Beleriand on the island of Tol Sirion, and it watched over the uh, fi- the plains of Ard Galen, which were between Angband, uh, Angband, and Beleriand. So similarly to how Minas Tirith in Gondor watches over Mordor, right? This this tower watches over Angband, which is a, a fortress of uh, Morgoth. So Oradreth is given rulership over Minas Tirith, and when Gilgalad was fairly young, um, again we don't know the exact like year of his birth because his a lot of his origins are murky, and there's mm-hmm. um, we don't know the exact year of his birth. 
um, he is sent away with his mother to the Havens of Fallas, which is where Círdan, the shipwright, rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is on the western coast of uh, Beleriand. Um, and he sends him there in anticipation of an attack, uh, which he's correct at, uh, correct on the Dagor uh, Bragalok, the Battle of Sudden Flame, where fires spew forth and mm. um, Morgoth just wreaks havoc. Which you sort of, did you say that that might have been what um, Galadriel saw in the Palantir? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, she was there. Um, but so. But that's what your theory is in the trailer, or like the most recent version of the trailer, that when we see her looking in the Palantir, that we see a shot of that. And her brother is fighting in that as well? Yeah, her brother dies. Got it, got um, it, in Finrod. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a lot of people die. Um, yeah, so it's it's prob- that's probably Dagger Bagalak. Could, could be the first kin slaying. Uh, we also see a shot in the latest trailer uh, that potentially could be the Nirnath Arnodad. There's a lot of these battles in the first stage. Um, so he sends, uh, Orodreth sends Gilgal, uh, Gilgalad and, um, his wife away to be with Círdan away from this, right? Um, and shortly after the Dagor Bragalak, Sauron takes control of Tol Syrian. Okay. So Sauron was active in the first age as a lieutenant of Morgoth, and he makes his home on Tol Syrian, um, takes over Minas Tirith, and it becomes known as Tol in Gwarhoth, or the Isle of Werewolves, because Sauron is a shapeshifter, and oh, one of the no. forms he took was the form of a wolf, and he had these werewolf creatures and, and vampires and stuff. Um, oh, that's such a, was so funny. I was thinking about how in whatever that Gary Oldman vampire movie was he takes the shape of a werewolf as well and so it had me yeah. thinking about vampires that's interesting yeah that sauron in the first age definitely has a lot of that flavor to him gotcha um so tolkien folding that kind of mythology into his story um so sauron takes over where ordreth used to be but ordreth gets away and he flees to uh nargothrond an elf fortress um and his uncle or just uncle Finrod uh is currently ruling over Nargothrond. Um so he escapes back at the Havens of Falos with Kirdan. Um the the two strongholds there, uh Brithombar and Eglarest, these are the two elven outposts at the Havens of Falos, those eventually are besieged. By Morgoth's forces, because with the fall of uh, Minas Tirith at Tol Sirion, you no longer have this kind of buffer zone between uh, Morgoth's forces and the rest of Beleriand. So Morgoth just kind of at the Dagor Bragalak does a lot of damage, and they're eventually over able to kind of overtake the elves and just work their way south into Beleriand. So they eventually get all the way to the Havens of Falas. They besiege Brithambar and Eglarest. And uh, after the Nirnaeth, our Noadad, um, Morgoth's forces completely take over those two outposts, those two cities. Um, and Círdan is able to escape with Gilgalad and a bunch of other refugees, and they sail to the Isle of Balar, which is this island off of the... Uh, it's in, in the, the Bay of Balar, and I believe, um, according to Elf beliefs and elf legend this is like a tip of the island um which i'm blanking on the name of right now Hmm. um but when remember when the the elves uh went to valinor Mm -hmm. uh, originally originally okay yeah so the way they got there was on an island that was like a ship okay so it like moved uh through the power of the the valar and so, according to elf legend, the the Isle of Balar is like the the little a little tip of this island that just kind of broke off. Oh, when, the, when this island uh, shuttled the elves to Valinor. <laughs> Wild. Wild. No, yeah. no, it's just interesting. It's just such interesting imagery and such. So I don't know. It just 
amazing to think that one man thought it's of insane this. it's awesome it's insane um so i want i want him to write our bible <laughs> tolkien yeah like hey let's just call the bible fiction already and let's let tolkien write it that's the right timeline it, yeah, if we ever get uh, somehow with our technology, we can we can contact him from the other side. Yeah, sure. We'll make it happen. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> I I endorse that idea. <laughs> um, so they are now on the Isle of Balar, Kirdan, Gilgalad, a bunch of refugees from uh from the from Berthambar and Eglarest, right? And they kind of are just they're surviving until the end of the first stage, until the War of Wrath. Um, we're not going to get into details, but Fingon dies in the Nirnath Arnoadad. So Fingon, uh, his brother then, uh, Turgon, is where the uh, leadership passes to. So that's why, you know, Gilgalad couldn't be Fingon's son in the original. I see. Uh, in the original conception of the character. So Fingon dies in the Nirnath Arnoadad. Um, so leadership passes to Turgon. Turgon dies in the fall of Gondolin, which is a whole other tale. So he dies. So then leadership passes to um, Gilgalad. Um, because I think he's, so he's, uh, Son of Ordreth, and Ordreth is Angrod's son. So leadership passes to Gilgalad. It's very convoluted, but that's how it works. Um, so at the end of the First Age, Gilgalad is the one with the claim to the kingship of the Noldor. And so what does he do with that in the Second Age? He actually establishes a kingdom of Linden and, and mm, rules. Which we didn't have. King. We didn't have. Um, and so... Uh, the elves that remained in Middle Earth um, basically go to Linden because it's where the king, the only guy who's claiming to be king, is. So you get a bunch of Noldor flocking there, um, and some Sindor and, and Nandor elves uh, who were living in Beleriand. You know, people who survived from Doriath. Um, so you have all, all, a sort of hodgepodge of different kinds of elves flocking to Linden after the destruction of Beleriand. Um, but not all is well. Because the elves, I mean, at the end of the first stage, there's a lot of conflict between these different groups of elves. So you have Celebrimbor, who is the grandson of Feanor, and a lot of Noldor leave with him. Okay. Because, I mean, remember, Feanor was like the rightful heir, and he died, and then Maethros gave away the kingship. Right. Right? So I, I my idea here is like, th there's a lot of Noldor who are kind of like, this guy, he's not of the house of Feanor. Like, why are we, you know, sure, Maethros gave up his right, but like, we're following this guy who should have been, you know, should have been king. He's He is more of a rightful, has mm -hmm. more of a rightful claim because he's actually part of that bloodline um, that they see as as being uh, correct. So they follow Celebrimbor, uh, a lot of the Noldor, not all of them, a lot of the Noldor follow Celebrimbor to go found the kingdom of Eregion which he leads. Um, and then you have some of the Sindor and Nandor elves. Nandor, um, I know that name because we've talked about it before because yes. we've watched what we do in the shadows together. Oh, <laughs> yes. I, it took me a second. Yes, different Nandor. I never made that connection. That's insane. I, I don't never... think there's any connection except for... It's the same word. Yeah, but the name, but that's, that's great. That's. I wonder if they're. That's a subtle nod to Tolkien. Could be. It's a really, really, really deep subtle nod. Yeah. That I, as a Tolkien fan and a What We Do in the Shadows fan, I never made that connection. That's how deep it is. Uh, so some of those elves, basically, the, you know, Sindar and Nandor, the elves that never made the journey. Um, a lot of them are like, we don't want to follow the Noldor. They killed our king, right? Um. Or they sorry, they didn't kill the king, but they did um they did take over Doriath from in the second Kinsling, right? So they invaded their kingdom. And so they we're gonna get out of here. So a lot of them go to Lothlorien, 
and a lot of them go to Greenwood the Great, which later becomes known as Mirkwood. Um, but Gilgalad still has a large group of people in his kingdom to rule over, so he does, uh, and he eventually becomes friends with Prince Aldarion of Numenor. Um, this is a character we won't talk too much about, but he's one of the princes over the thousands of years of history of Numenor uh, that sort of starts to establish more contact with Middle Earth. This is the beginning of the friendship between um, Linden and Numenor. In 882 of the Second Age, Gilgalad gives Aldarion a letter that um, he says, pass this on to your father, the king, uh, Tar Meneldur. Um, and he's basically warning the Numenorians. There's a shadow growing, as shadows like to do in Middle Earth. There's a shadow growing in the East. And basically warning them and going, look, we could really use your allyship, your friendship here, your aid. Um, we got to be careful. That's um, really interesting. And it's a total digression, but not really. If I'm not giving you a spoiler, but the season finale of... Stranger Things, there is a shadow that literally falls over the entire town of Hawkins, which is not strange because of how much Tolkien is brought up, at least in the first season. So, yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. Sorry, the, I just made that jump. The shat. No, I mean, it. Tolkien has had such an influence on any. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Stranger Things fantasy. It's more science fiction, but they're certainly drawing from that mm -hmm. because of like the D&D &D connection to D&D &D owes Radagast, so much to Tolkien. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that idea of a shadow growing in the background mm -hmm. is like so, yeah, it's so Tolkien and, and Middle Earth. And so we have that happening again. It happened, you know, in the first age with Morgoth. They like beat Morgoth and then he goes and then, oh, oh peacetime, but the shadow's growing. And then here we have, oh, the end of the first age, we... Def we literally cast Morgoth out, but Sauron's still around. Where is he? Who knows? Oh, the shadow's growing. So we know that Gilgalad is aware of this by 882 of the Second Age because we have this letter. Um, it's in Unfinished Tales. We can read the whole thing if you want to go check it out. Um, it's in the chapter about Aldarion. Um, so he's basically giving the Numenorians a heads up and being like, we're, we're going to need your help. Then about 100 years later in 1000 of the Second Age, we have Speak of the Devil, although they don't know it yet. Anatar. Oh, no. Comes to Linden. But if you remember when we talked about Elrond, because Elrond's chilling in Linden at this point, uh, Gil Gilgalad, Elrond, Círdan, they don't trust this guy. So they're like, get out of here. Interesting. He ends up going to Eregion. He failed the vibe check. Exactly. Yeah. They did not like his vibes. They went, you're, you're too pretty. You, you're you're too <laughs> smart and too good. and We're we, threatened. And like, where'd you come from? Who who the heck are you? You just show yeah. up out of nowhere. Um, and especially knowing, like, Gilgalad was aware of, oh, this power in the east is growing and evil forces are taking over stuff east of the Misty Mountains. Like, we, he had re certainly had reason to be somewhat distrustful, right? He was sure. on guard by this Sure. Um, so anyway, Sauron... Gets welcomed in with open arms to a Regan. We know all about that. Helps Celebrimbor make the rings. That goes swimmingly for them. Mm -hmm. So jumping forward to 1693 of the Second Age. When Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean. 1693, Columbus said, tee hee. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be the worst part of history. Oh, there you go. Put it in the wrap. Yeah. That's, that's the third verse. Um, 1693, the Second Age, War of the Elves and, of Sar uh, War of the Elves and Sauron begins. Uh, we get Celebrimbor distributing the Elven Rings, and he gives two of the Elven Rings to Gilgalad and Círdan. He gives Vilya to Gilgalad, and he gives Narya to uh, Círdan. Hold on, Kyr let me see if I remember this. Did Gilgalad give his ring to Gandalf? Or Close. did Círdan? Círdan gave his ring to Gandalf. Where did Galadriel get her ring? Directly from Celebrimbor. So the three OG recipients of the elven rings from Celebrimbor are Gilgalad gets Vilya, Círdan gets Narya, and Galadriel gets Nenya. 
when and Elrond does not have a ring currently in the, at this point in the story. But he does get a ring. Yes, we will get to that. Okay. Um, but yeah, this by is the time called of, the podcast of the rings, I need to bring it back. We, we <laughs> need to know where these rings are at at all yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super important. Don't yes. lose them. Keep yeah. them. Keep them secret. Keep them safe. Don't okay? put them on. Don't use them. <laughs> He'll know where you are. <laughs> um, oh my God, Sauron is Santa. He'll see you when you're sleeping. He's got a big red eye. <laughs> I he just knows if you've been bad or good. And this is Warner Brothers theme. Oh, <laughs> oh no, we're going to get a DMC. We're going to do the Animaniacs, yeah. Um, is that? I hope it's public domain. <sighs> Edit it out if it's so. not. I we'll just auto-tune so. it. Uh, um, so those are the, the status of the rings. Very important at this point. Um, Gilgalad, then, we talked about this last week, sends Elrond... To aid Eregion against Sauron. It sounds like you said Elrond, and I know you said Elrond. Elron Hubbard. That's what it sounded like. The uh, he sent him to aid in the uh, uh, pro- procuring of clams, and then and some. to to help guard the elves against Thetans. Yep, 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 yep. Um, yep. It doesn't a volcano play a big part in? In his myth, too. I don't too. want to even talk about this person anymore. So okay, fair. moving on. I just find it all fascinating because it's, it's another uh, fair. very detailed mythology. Fair. Um, so Elrond leaves Linden at the behest of Gilgalad, aids Eregion against Sauron's forces. And we know that leads to the foundation of Imladris and, and helping a lot of refugees escape there. Um, after their defeat in Eregion in 1695 of the Second Age, Sauron begins to march further into Eriador. Eriador being the region where the Shire is, the northern region of, of Middle-earth. Um, so he begins to go further and further into Eriador. And the reason for this is that he assumes that he kn- he knows Celebrimbor doesn't have the Elven Rings because at this point he's been killed, tortured. He wouldn't give up any information on him, but he didn't have them. Mm-hmm. So Sauron knows Celebrimbor's distributed the rings. And so in Sauron's mind, he's like, okay, who would get these? Well, Gilgalad is the king, right? He's probably the one of the next most important elves. Gilgalad probably has at least one of the rings. And I know we'll I think talk he, about this more when we do get to Celebrimbor, but Celebrimbor had the authority to give out the rings to whom he thought, as I mean, opposed he, to being told by Sauron, again, Anatar, to... To whom to give the rings to? Yes. Why? Because we'll talk Saur- about that later. Saur- yeah, Sauron didn't know about the Elven Rings. That's right. Yep, got yeah. it. Originally, that's so. right. That's he, right. He made them apart. I forgot. Forgot. Yeah. Forgot. Forgot. Um, so Sauron marches into Eriador, um, and he's basically gunning for Gilgalad. He wants to get these Elven Rings. Um. He doesn't fully go into Linden, though. So Linden is bordered on the east by the Blue Mountains. Um, so they have kind of a good natural defense. Um, and at this point, Gilgalad sees all this going on, and he phones up his buddies, the Numenorians, going, hey, that would be a really good time for that help. Remember I warned you about this? Yeah, well, it's happening. I know that was like, you know, almost... It was like 800, 900 years ago. There's like a different king ruling now, but like I could really use your help. Uh, and five years later, uh, eventually it happens, but Sauron has overtaken most of Eriador. He's right on Gilgala's doorstep in Linden. But Tar Minister, the then ruler of Numenor, sends his fleets and they arrive and they help defeat Sauron's forces. They, with the help of Gilgalad, and Elrond with his force in, mm-hmm. in uh, Imladris, Rivendell, and Tar Minister's ships, they drive Sauron out of Eriador um, and defeat him in this sort of this section of the war. Um, that's pretty pretty much the end of the War of Elves and Sauron. Um, so it's kind of a victory, but not really because Eregion is completely sacked and destroyed, and pretty much all of Eriador is laying in ruin. With the exception of Imladris and Linden. And, um, so Eriador, most... you said, is where the Shire is. It's, yeah, it's the northwestern portion of Middle Earth. 
So it's bordered on the east by the Misty Mountains. It's and it go it extends out to the sea, uh, and then pretty much before you get to you know like Dunland and and sort of the getting into the Gap of Rohan area is basically Eriador. So the northwestern part of uh, the map. So I know this is not talked about too deeply in Tolkien's writings, and never is it is this, like I think we're. We know that he uh, the show is adding Harfoots in, whether or not they fit into the lore as we know it. I'm curious then if they'll keep the location of where the fight was true in the show, and where the Harfoots are during that. Like what I, part of I can the world? answer that question. So, based on what we know about the Harfoots, which I I'm I think it's interesting because the showrunners have said they they're kind of interpreting it as they're not hobbits. They've said Harfoots are not hobbits, but I always interpreted it as they are hobbits, but they were more, they were just kind of distinct, almost houses, kind of like the elves have the houses, but peoples of hobbits. So the Harfoots are one of those. They're interpreting it more as them being progenitors to hobbits, which okay, it's an interesting take. I which don't agree still with is. That. Could mean that they were in the Shire prior, but if it was the, ho- the Hobbits did not did not I- inhabit the Shire until later. Mm-hmm. Um, Got it. So, in the Second Age, the Harfoots are a migratory people, and we they're nomadic people. Oh, and so they were hanging out, kind of, I believe, near the Misty Mountains. I think on the eastern side of the the Misty Mountains. But they were much further east. Okay. Um, Interesting. And they migrated eventually going further, further west until um, in the Third Age. I, be- I, I believe it's not till the Third Age. I, I could look up uh, when exactly the Shire is founded, but I don't believe it's until the Third Age. So all of that That area, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, or maybe late, late Second Age. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we're, they're they're not going to be in that area when we see them in the show. Gotcha. Um, ha cha cha. Ha cha 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 cha. So where was I? Gilgalad, with the help of the Numenorean aid, five years late, but hey, better late than never. Uh, drives Sauron out of Eriador, and afterwards. He's like, Elrond, you know what? You did a great job leading your forces in Imladris. I'm appointing you vice regent. Ah. So he's his right-hand man officially. And he... That's kind of tasteless seeing as that other person had to cut off their right hand. Medros, yeah. That's really that's really ins- insensitive of you. All right. He's his left-hand man. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know... A lot of people lose hands. I have to keep it you happens. honest, okay? All right, okay. I apologize. Okay. I apologize for being insensitive. That's my bad. <laughs> he appoints him vice regent. Okay. <laughs> and this is the, the point where he gives him Vilya. Okay. It's okay. at this moment, oh. after this big victory, right? Gives him the ring and says, I trust you. And it says, will you marry me? But but yeah, totally. No, sadly, Gilgal does not marry. Okay. Um. All right. Now we have a a big sort of time jump. Uh, we'll get into more of this. I don't want to talk too much about it until we talk about the Numerians. But our Farazan <laughs> is a ruler. We're going to see him in the show. Okay. At this point, he was known as Tarkalion for various reasons we'll get into. But he ends up capturing Sauron and bringing him back to Numenor. So Sauron was defeated, but they just drove him out, right? They didn't actually, you know, defeat, defeat him. Got it. But our Farzan captures him, brings him back to Numenor. And during this time of Sauron not being in Middle-earth, Gilgalad starts to rebuild his power and his strength. He, he Without expand- the ring. Yeah, he doesn't have the ring at this point. But he doesn't really need it because there's the enemy has been captured, right? Right. There's kind of remnant evil things lingering, but without a leader to guide them, right? He expands the kingdom back out um, all the way as far east um, as 
I think past the Misty Mountains, it says. Um, but anyway, he expands his power again. So kind of rebuilding. Um, and then the downfall of Numenor happens. Um, and we get the exile, the kings in exile from the, from Numenor, um, Elendil, uh, Asildur, and Anarion. Um, that kind of lineage. And in the kingdom of Arnor in the north that is founded, um, Gilgalad has the white towers built um, for Elendil. And it is in one of these towers that uh, Palantir is housed. One of them or all of them? One of them. Ooh, we got to talk about how they were even created, but that's a whole nother topic. That we'll get day. to there with the Numenorians. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Tight, but, tight, tight, tight. But with this specific Palantir, it was sort of attuned to only look westward. It couldn't communicate with the other ones. Oh, interesting. And so it was pretty much used by the elves to like look into the undying lands and just kind of be like, ah, home. Like it, it didn't really have like the power of the Palantir you see in Lord of the Rings that are right. used. Um, but Gilgal had built this, um, for Elendil to use this stone and he tried to look, I think tried to use it to see like maybe where Numenor was at one point, but we don't know a ton about it, but he has the white towers built. Um, and then jumping forward even further, we, we get to near the end of the second age, 34, 31 of the second age, we have... Uh, Elendil and Gilgalad forming the last alliance. Now, Sauron had gone back to Mordor after the destruction of Numenor and rebuilt his strength and was marshalling his troops. And so this is what we see in the prologue uh, in the films of Lord of the Rings where we have the uh, the last alliance of elves and men fighting against Sauron. Um, not for the last time, but for what they think is the last time. Right. It's kind of kind of a, a misnomer. The last alliance. It, it really wasn't the last for alliance. For that age. Yeah. For yeah, that age. Th- they thought it would be. Uh so they marshal in um in Arnor, where where Arnor was. Um they march south to Mordor. They end up breaking through the Black Gate at Kirith Gorgor. Um, and they lay siege to Baradur, the Dark Tower. Mm-hmm. The siege lasts for seven years. Whoa. Yeah, you thought, I mean, 30 years hanging up there is a long time, but besieging a tower for seven years with, without a break, kind of insane. Um, these, these sieges in Tolkien's world last so long. Wow. Uh, but again, it's elves, right? Right. They don't sleep as yeah. far Although as Although there, there are men there too, but I guess they're the just The men like... sleep. The elves are just like these stupid men. That's why they're <laughs> like, this is the last alliance because all they do is sleep. Yeah. We're, it, it, we, can't, we can't continue with these guys after No, this. they suck. We're done. We're done. Yeah, they're not um, on our level. Yeah, get, get with it. Get with the program. Just live forever. Come on. <laughs> you chose mortalhood? <laughs> <laughs> right. What a chump. Uh, so after seven years of siege, Sauron has had enough. He's like, C- come on, guys. You're, you Really? You're still at this? So Sauron emerges from Baradur, and he breaks the siege <laughs> with, his, with his forces. He comes to the battlefield himself. He's like, all right, we got we to take care of this. This is I want to really leave. Sad. You guys are still trying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tired of just ordering Postmates for dinner. Like, I want to actually go said out. Said no eat. one ever. But carry on. <laughs> Look, the the service in Mortar at the time with Postmates was pretty terrible. I so can imagine. That's he right. he was fed up at that point. He's like, I just want to sit down and eat in a restaurant. So he comes forth, breaks the siege, pushes them back, and in this final battle, he one on one or one on two really. Uh, fights Elendil and Gilgalad and kills both of them. Oh no. In this battle. Spoiler. This is where they meet their doom. And um now spoilers, Sauron is killed or defeated, not really killed. Defeated uh with the shards of 
of and Marisol. And Elendil is his dad, right? Uh, is Who's dad? Who's Elendil? Isildur and Anarion. Isildur. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Elendil's yeah, yeah. dad dies, or excuse right. me, Isildur's dad dies. Isildur picks up the sword and cuts off the fingers. Uh, we, we all know that tale. Uh, and if we don't, we'll talk about it very soon. But uh, what I think is really cool is in, um, I actually, because I we, we read something for the beginning of Gilgalad. Um, in the in the chapter of Council of Elrond, we get this really cool line that I never noticed, but in researching this, um, so we we have the recounting um, by Gandalf of the um, where he Battle. finds the the accounting of Isildur uh, and like the ring mm. and sort of what happens to it, and so we we get. Uh, this line or this passage um, where he's talking about the inscription, uh, I deem it to be a tongue of the black land since it is foul and uncouth. What evil it saith, I do not know, but I trace here a copy of it, lest it fade beyond recall. The ring misseth maybe the heat of Sauron's hand, which was black and yet burned like fire. And so Gilgalad was destroyed. And maybe were the gold made hot again, the writing would be refreshed. So this is where he learns, oh, if I cast this into the fire, can see the writing but he says the heat of sauron's hand black and yet burned like fire and so gilgalad was destroyed so gilgalad we don't get like a detailed description of this fight but gilgalad was literally killed by the heat from sauron's hand that's actually horrifying it is like i i want to know i want a song about that that describes this battle but just imagining Sauron like with his ha- bare hands or gauntleted hands. And I just... feel like he's just gonna push his hand through Gilgalad, Gilgalad, and and just create like a comically sized handprint in his body, like a knife through hot butter. Just I can I would I, mark this date and time. Let's see if the TV show remembers this and does it. I'd be I... really curious. We're. I know for a fact that the the final the finale, right? We're, you you have to end it here, right? With the last alliance, that's like the last thing they're gonna do. I. But again, if it's a series, which it is, they may not end with this. This season. Oh, no, no, we're not gonna see it this season. This is okay. Like that's what I'm saying. Right, right, right. Down the line, this is the end of the show. I, I like one whole season will be dedicated to all the things that lead up to this fight. I think. Yeah, I guess. Totally. This is the culmination of everything in the Second Age. So, right. but yeah, I, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Elendil and Gagalad fighting Sauron like that, and and I I hope they fisticuffs. Yeah, I mean, we this is I, the passage I read is from Lord of the Rings, so they they have that, and it's one of the times we get Gilgalad mentioned in the book. So I hope we're gonna see. I mean, sorry to uh, I think was it Benjamin Walker is the actor. Sorry, but I want to <laughs> see Sauron just grab you by the face and like. <sighs> yeah, that. like it's it's such a cool death. It's such a cool death. If you had cool to die, character. that's how you're gonna go. Yeah, from I just a hot hand. Sounds awful. Sounds awful to me. Um, so that's the, the end of Gilgalad, the last High King of the Noldor. After that, no one, that he, he didn't have an heir. So there was no, that the line ended with him. And we don't know if he reincarnates or anything like that. Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, he just, his, his spirit goes to the halls of Mandos and. What is your yeah. opinion on this, this character? Important uh, or just like a secondary character? No, very important. Okay. Very important to all of the. Uh, I mean, he, such a major player in the Second Age. He's he's the king during the Second Age. So he's right. the one marshaling forces against against Sauron. He's the one, um, you know, appointing Elrond. Like, right, uh, right, you right. go lead Rivendell. You be my vice regent. Right. Um. He, so he and and he's the one who f- makes this alliance, makes this friendship with the Numenorians. Right. So a very important player um, in the Second Age, uh, and he uh, he again he doesn't really do a lot in the First Age, but that's because he's young. He's a right. young elf then. Um, 
but he has again these familial connections to very important people um in the first age um and i i also think it's just interesting he's one of these characters where we get like we talked about in the very beginning we get this kind of insight into tolkien's writing process so it's cool to see that when i was doing this research i was like this is fascinating um there's a lot of different versions of of the origins of this character and uh i i one thing i didn't point out is that in the published silmarillion uh we get gilgalad as being um listed i believe as uh finrod's son mm. which is according to tolkien's latest you know accounting is incorrect but um, the the reasoning that Christopher Tolkien used for publishing that version was it was the one that interfered least with everything else in the story because uh. if you change it to being, you know, the son of Oradreth, there's a lot of other pieces that have to be tweaked in order to make that fit with the narrative. And so Tolkien, again, just never got around to adjusting that before he died and the the Silmarillion was only published a handful of years after his death, so Tolkien or Christopher Tolkien just kind of went with the one that he didn't have to do as much work with. Yeah, yeah, and and later he regretted it. He said, "Yeah, it was probably a mistake. I probably should have just not said anything definitive about his parentage." How interesting. So yeah, he la- he later was like, "Yeah, that was huh. not the best thing to do." So, huh. but it's just interesting that through this character we get to kind of see the evolution of uh the story. Most definitely. Uh, that is a, that uh, that just like these stories are amazing and deep Tolkien is so intertwined with that and makes the myth that much more special because of him and his connection. not connection obviously he's the writer but because of how he created it um i think that's awesome i'm really excited for next week i didn't know I, I, anything about this character that we cover today and i'm but i'm really thrilled for next week what are we doing next week next week we're diving into numenor Ooh. so we're going to be i talking... like myself a numenor <laughs> yeah what 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 excites you about numenor men all the men. All yeah, the we, men. we've really just been focused on on elves and dwarves. So mm-hmm. now we get to those hunky, hunky men. Yeah, uh, and especially the Numenorians because they're very tall. They're I, very I, tall. I we'll get it. into it. We'll get into it next week. So there's a lot of Numenorian characters. We're gonna kind of roll them all into one episode because all their storylines kind of intersect. So Elendil, Isildur, Anarian. Those are our main three we're going to be talking about. The, awesome. the family, the father and the sons, uh, all about Numenor. And it's long storied history next week. I'm so excited. Thank you for all this hard work that you do and making this mostly digestible. I try. You, you do. Uh, I'll see you next time. And until then, may our roads meet again. Dun 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 dun